Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to Coffee Chatter, episode 5. Last week was a misprint when I made up the movie. First up, an update to I'll Call the Midwife Fans series, English Equivalent of Season 3, is now streaming on Netflix. As you know, last week on Dancing with the Stars was the final week of the two-night specials. Last week's eliminated player was Tavis Smiley. The third week of competition featured songs from many movies, some of which we haven't heard from about in years. It also produced not one, but two perfect scores, and a mix-up in the leaderboard. Kevin Hart guest starred as a judge. Dancing first was Randy and Karina, who were also the first couple in Jeopardy for this week. They danced a passage away from the movie Rocky, which was very energetic and a good form. 28. 26. Sorry. Randy and Karina were sent home one week shy of Personal Stories Week, my favorite. It's always a bummer for whoever is sent home before that week. Next was Alfonso and Whitney with a quick step to an Austin Powers song. His footing was a little off in the beginning, but he got better as the dance went on, earning a 32. Fashion star Betsy Johnson and Tony were next, dancing a contemporary to a song from the Ghost movie. There is only one word to describe this dance, and that is stunning. Any 72-year-old that can perform a contemporary dance like she did is completely awesome. She earned a 29, which is one of her highest scores of the season so far. Michael and Emma performed a waltz to a song from Robin Hood, which was actually one of his better dances. His major problem is he seems to tense up right before the dancing starts, which makes him very rigid. If he would relax and stop tensing, his scores might be a bit better. 28 out of 40. Another thing that I think is wrong with Michael is that their height difference is causing a problem. Michael is very tall and Emma, Emma is more on the lower end of, of average which I think is very hard, especially in the, in the together dances, like a waltz. It's much better if you're the same height or close enough. Antonio and Cheryl were next, and the second couple to be in Jeopardy, although they were the first saved. They had a foxtrot to Guardians of the Galaxy, which offered solid moves, but he did seem a little stiff at the beginning. 29. Country sweetheart Sadie and her partner Mark were next, dancing a Viennese waltz to the Disney movie Up. And up she went. Sadie is back in the dancing saddle. That was a beautiful dance and my favorite of the night. 32. Jonathan and Allison were the third couple deemed in Jeopardy and Jonathan was actually part of the bottom two. They had a tango from Back to Black, which I believe is from the movie Men in Black. If you know, please correct me. It was a decent dance, but it was a little choppy. I don't know what the score actually was as I forgot to write it down, but if I remember correctly, it might have been 28 or 29. Janelle and Val had the first perfect score of the season, dancing a jazz routine to West Side Stories America. They did an awesome job considering halfway through the week the production team told them they had to change their routine because it looked too similar to the dance done in the movie. Like I said, perfect 40. Tommy and Peta were next to shock us all with a stunning Argentine tango to a song from Sensible Woman. For his age, 76, this dance was very stunning and flawless. 34 out of 40. The Argentine tango is not an easy dance. In fact, it's one of the hardest to learn. So for a 76 year old to come out and give it a 34 is very impressive. Bethany and Derek ended out the night with a perfect score to a jazz routine from Singing in the Rain. They were surprised with a visit from Patricia Kelly, Jean Kelly's wife. Beautiful performance to a classic movie. Next week is my favorite theme, Personal Stories Week. For those that tune in, make sure you sit down prepared with tissues, as at least one story is always emotional, and I guarantee you Jonathan's is going to be, because Jonathan is probably going to pick the year his dad died. They also announced that in two weeks, the partner switch up is back. In case you forgot how it works, you use hashtag DWTS and then put the star's first name with who you want to see them dance with for that week. For example, if I wanted Sadie to dance with Artem, my hashtag would be hashtag DWTS Sadie Artem. 
And you do that with all of the dancers, and if enough people vote for the same person, they will be dancing with whoever the voters release. Cold case section. We're in Tennessee this week. Let's go down to the countryside. On July 20th, 1985, the burned body of Betty Joyce Brown, a.k.a. Simmons, was found in the woods at 3805 Maloney Road in South Knox County. The 29-year-old Austin East graduate had been stabbed before being burned. Miss Brown was last seen on July 14th, 1985, between midnight and 1 a.m. in front of the bread box at Magnolia Ave and Spruce Street. It is believed that Miss Brown was offered and accepted a ride from an unknown subject. Miss Brown's last known address was 2737 Tarleton Ave. Initial investigation indicated that when Miss Brown's body was found, she had been dead approximately one week. Family members describe Miss Brown as being a very sweet and loving mother. If you have any information, please call the Knox County Sheriff's Office Cold Case Unit at 865-215-3520 or 3590, they have two lines, or email coldcase at knoxsheriff.org. Movie reviews, let's talk about Stardust. Stardust was a very interesting movie. If I had to describe it, it would be Disney fairy tale on crack. It was about a man named Tristan who falls in love with a woman named Victoria. Now, Victoria is one of those you-owe-me-everything kind of girls that expects a lot from the boyfriend husband. They see a star, and Tristan, being the love-struck gentleman that he is, says, I would get you the star if you'd marry me, not realizing that she actually expects him to get the star. When he catches the star, he realizes that the star is actually a person. He ends up falling in love with the person in the star and leaves Victoria, which then takes him on a very long journey, ending in an epic battle with three witches. At the end, Tristan becomes king and marries the star woman, leaving Victoria in the dust. It's very interesting, definitely a B-rated movie, especially in the creative department. And as I'm using social media, a.k.a. texting, during my recording of my show. Anyway, TV reviews. There's a few that I watched this week. The first one is 19 Kids and Counting. I know, I know, I'm way behind on the show, but I started watching from the very beginning on Netflix the other night because it was next in my list. Well, it's hard for some people to get into this show, and I admit I may not last all the way until the current season, but it is interesting to watch how this very large family gets through everyday life. We'll see how far into the show I get before I decide not to watch anymore. The next show is On the Case with Paula Zahn. This, unfortunately, was a one-night treat for me as Comcast had a malfunction on their end that opened up a bunch of paid customers to stations not included on their package. So I was surprised to be channel surfing one and stumble upon the fact that 252 ID Investigation Discovery actually worked. I enjoyed the one night of this show that I got to watch. The host of the show is Paula Zahn and she, she's really good at what she does. It's very similar to Forensic Files or Unsolved Mysteries, but on a more factual standpoint. This station has other great shows such as Homicide Hunter, 48 Hours, and so on. I hope that once I start subbing more, I'll be able to contribute to the cable bill and will be able to upgrade to the next package so I can watch these shows more often, as well as shows I miss on other stations we don't get, like Long Island Medium, The Haunting Up, and Psychic Intervention. I also had a restaurant review this week of Sal's Pizza. Tuesday night was date night for Dustin and I. This is last Tuesday, obviously, and we chose Sal's to order from. Surprised that they delivered over here and doubly impressed that they found our address without getting lost. Their pizza is delicious and very large in quantity. One slice is about the size of both your hands. The only thing I wasn't 100% impressed with was their garlic bread. It was good but oddly put together. Overall, a good restaurant that comes from Boston. Reflection Corner our first reading today is from the second book of Timothy, chapter 3, verses 14 through 17. But you, remain faithful to what you have learned and believed, because you know from whom you learned it, and that from infancy you have known the sacred scriptures, 
which are capable of giving you wisdom for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. All scripture is inspired by God and is useful for teaching, for refutation, for correction, and for training in righteousness, so that one who belongs to God may be com competent, equipped for every good work. Our psalm this week is one of the longest psalms, actually the longest psalm in the book of Psalms, Psalm 119, verses 9 through 14. How can the young walk without fault? Only by keeping your words. With all my heart I seek you. Do not lead, let me stray from your commands. In my heart I treasure your promise, that I may not sin against you. Blessed are you, O Lord, teach me your laws. With my lips I recite all the edicts you have spoken. I find joy in the way of your decrees more than in all riches. Our gospel message today comes from Matthew 13 verses 47 to 52. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a net thrown into the sea, which collects fish of every kind. When it is full, they, had, they haul it ashore and sit down to put what is good in buckets. What, what is bad, they throw away. Thus it will be at the end of the age. The angels will go out and separate the wicked from the righteous and throw them into the fiery furnace where there will be wailing and grinding of teeth. Do you understand all these things? They answered yes, and he replied, Then every scribe who has been instructed in the kingdom of heaven is like the head of a household who brings from his storeroom both the new and the old. With so much talk in recent years about the end of the world and your Catholics that allegedly read the Bible every day, believing wholeheartedly that it's going to happen exactly as Revelation describes it, or worse, they actually believe the pastors that kept predicting. This rendition from Matthew sounds much calmer. We're taught as Christians Catholics that the world will not end unless God says so. And we honestly will not know when it will happen. We just know that whoever is a believer will be saved, and whoever de denounces Christ as their Savior will be tortured. That is what the scripture tells us, which is what the first reading drives home. The Bible is not just a pretty book to sit on your coffee table and collect dust and drink rings. It's not to make yourself look good to friends, it's for you to read. The words written in that are what we believe in. And not only are they used to teach, correct, and train us, but also for us to go out and do that with others. I'm not talking about in a solicitor way of knocking on doors, but say, if you're out with a friend and she tells you she is doing something that you know is against scripture, you can gently explain to her that her action is not honorable, and then, if necessary, point out the verses in scripture that back you up. Let's dust off our Bibles and actually read them for once this week. These two saints that we talk about today literally clinged to scripture. Let's learn about them. Our first is Saint Jerome. Jerome is the patron saint of librarians and scholars and was born around 345 in Dalmatia. He was an avid student studying Latin and Greek in Rome where he was baptized at the age of 18. From Rome he traveled to Gaul, then to Aquileia in Italy, and finally to Antioch in Syria. There, Jerome studied theology and enjoyed classical literature. Then something happened that changed Jerome's life. Jerome came down with a high fever and became delirious. He had a vision in which he saw himself standing before Christ who challenged Jerome, saying he was not a true Christian but a follower of Cicero, the Roman orator. Jerome promised to be true to Jesus and to give up his preoccupation with classical literature. From then on, Jerome devoted himself solely to the study of the Bible. Disturbed by, this, by his vision, Jerome went into the wilderness outside Antioch. He spent four years there fasting and wrestling with his earthly desires. During this time, Jerome studied Hebrew and eventually mastered it. He later translated the Bible into Latin, which is known today as the Vulgate Bible. In 386, Jerome traveled to Bethlehem, where he joined a monastery and became its leader. A fervent Bible scholar, he continued to write and study. 
In 410, when Christians were forced to, be, to flee Rome, the monastery offered them refuge. Jerome wrote, I cannot help them all, but I grieve and weep with them. Today we must translate the words of the scriptures into deeds, and instead of speaking saintly words, we must act them. About six years later, Jerome's health and sight began to deteriorate. He died peacefully on September 30th. As Roman Christians were driven out of their homes in the wake of barbarian attacks on Rome, Jerome's monastery in Bethlehem took them in. We can help people who need a place to stay too. We can donate time or money on behalf of the homeless or refugees from wars, natural disasters, or political oppression. There are also many little ways in which we can share our space with others. Open your home for the holidays to shut-ins, missionaries, or students who may not have anyone to spend time with or live too far away. Perfect example of this is your transfer students that come from other countries to come to school here in the United States. They obviously don't have the money or the time to travel all the way back to, say, China or Ireland. You could invite them in to your home for the holidays and make them feel welcome in this country. Give up your seat on trains or buses and airplanes and in waiting rooms to the elderly or disabled who need the seat more than you do. When new employees or visitors come to your workplace, welcome them and help them to feel at home. This includes your churches. Everyone needs a place of refuge once in a while, whether homeless, uprooted by war, or simply overworked. We can help by offering compassion and hospitality whenever possible. Our next saint is Saint Simon of Crepe. Simon was a reconciler of kings and was born in 1048 into one of the most illustrious families of France. He was a descendant of Clement Charlemagne the Great and related by marriage to William of Normandy, who conquered England at the Battle of Hastings in 1066. Who remembers that line from that stupid commercial for the phone? When Simon's father, Raul the Third died in 1072, Philip I of France tried to annex Simon's land, but William of Normandy helped him to keep it. William wanted Simon to marry his daughter, but Simon wanted to become a monk. Worried about offending William, Simon did not want to face him and turn down the marriage proposal. So on the pretext of investigating the legality of the marriage because the woman was his relative, Simon set out for Rome. Along the way, he entered an abbey at Condat in the Jura and took his vows as a monk. Sneaky little dude, isn't he? Even though being a monk prevented Simon from marrying, the French aristocracy, Hugh of Cluny, once sent Simon to recover lands that had been taken from the famous monastery at Cluny, and he was called upon to act as a mediator between William the Conqueror and his sons. Beginning in 1080, Simon was retained as a close advisor of Pope Gregory the Seventh. Then, in 1082, while still in his 30s, Simon died in Rome, having received the last sacraments from Gregory himself. He was buried in St. Peter's Basilica. Jesus said, Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called children of God. Matthew 5, verse 9. Simon was indeed a blessed peacemaker, using his great influence whenever possible among friends and high government officials. Closer to our own time, great strides at peacemaking have been made in countries that have been plagued with armed violence, such as the former USSR and Ireland. In the Soviet Union, Mikhail Gorbachev softened past communist policies, allowing more freedom to the people and ended military occupation of Afghanistan. His policies led to the fall of communism in his nation. David Trimble, however, the former first minister of Ireland, has worked for years to try to find a solution in war-torn Northern Ireland. Trimble continues his efforts to negotiate with the Irish Republican Army, or the IRA. Wherever there are feuding factions, the quest for peace never ends. Through the valiant efforts of dedicated individuals such as these, many lives could be saved. Our closing prayer today is actually one composed by St. Jerome. 
Show me, O Lord, your mercy, and delight my heart with it. Let me find you whom I seek so longingly. See, here is the man whom the robbers seized, mishandled, and left half dead on the road to Jericho. O kind-hearted Samaritan, come to my aid. I am the sheep who wandered into the wilderness. Seek after me and bring me home again to your fold. Do with me what you will, that I may stay by you all the days of my life, and praise you with all those who are with you in heaven for all eternity. This week's fan of the week is Ann Gates, who answered this week's late question correctly. The answer was Intel. Next week will feature a new category since it will be October, so hopefully you might have better luck. I will see you next week.